Well, you know what they say, it's a wonderful time of the year, as the song goes, and it's a wonderful time to be a bull in the market. Today we're going to be talking about exactly what happened this week, where the market could be going, and if you guys have been following for the last three weeks, the callouts have been banger every single time. So let's dive into another week of amazing trading, and what we're going to plan for and recapping the week. S&P closes again at a new all-time high. Wonderful, wonderful news, right? If my bullish portfolio is doing amazing again, I was a bear for quite some time. Now I'm team bull just because the fervency of the bulls have absolutely astounded everyone. I don't think anyone predicted how fervent these bulls are willing to buy the market. So subsequently, rather than trying to fight the market, I basically just joined the winning side of the team with a cautious approach. And I'll be discussing that today with you guys of what we need to keep an eye on. None of the things have shown a red flag yet, but we always have to look at them on a weekly to weekly basis to know if they are going to show up. So simply put, S&P, wonderful close. We didn't even see any bearishness, right? We didn't even get back below 592 on the S&P and subsequently wonderful, wonderful news. However, the NASDAQ on the flip side was a bit different of a story. We chopped around a weekly breakout for quite some time as we started the week out on basically Monday, slamming down below the weekly range and then doing it again on Wednesday. So again, short and trading a week. So there was again, Friday, one of those higher volume days. However, we stayed above the nine day moving average consistently on the NASDAQ combined with the slump in some of the bigger cap stocks like NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA having a pretty bearish week, but if you look at this closely, you would notice that we closed around that 50 day moving average, basically forming a inverse morning star pattern, which Essentially, for all those that don't know what that is, it's basically where you gap down, gap back up, and it's an extremely bullish pattern. So that we could be seeing a reversal in NVIDIA. We'll keep you guys appraised of it. NVIDIA is my largest holdings, full disclosure there. So obviously I want this thing to go up. However, if it closed two days below the 50 day moving average, that'd be red alarm, red alert. We need to take a look at why it's doing that. Also, if we see the Russell having another fantastic week, consolidating after a massive push. So let's see, S&P closing at new all-time highs, NASDAQ consolidating but still going in an upward trend, and Russell consolidating. Well, that's a making of a very bullish week, especially with the fear and greed sitting right at 66. Wonderful, wonderful time to be alive if you are a bull out there. And we got some interesting news this last week, right? We got the PCE data that came out with the pending home sales. So core came in at 2.8 versus 2.8 expected. And then subsequently PCE 2.3 versus 2.3 expected a tick up in inflation. However, it did not damper the analyst odds for the December rate cut. They actually increased to 66 versus 34. So we are sitting in an expected rate cut for December. However, we have to keep an eye on what is gonna be the projection for the Federal Reserve. Right now, the markets, if we go to the December meeting, we can see of next year, not this current December, we can see two to three rate cuts being the consensus with four being the outlier for it. So again, anchoring in reasonable expectations for the Fed because this is where really, if they give you three, no one's disappointed. The two and the three will consolidate into that, still keeping the odds open. It's not really world shattering. And then again, three is the consensus that the market is currently pricing in. So we don't really see any rift tides coming to basically break the market up. So everything is looking hunky dory. We also got more news out there with Donald Trump appointing basically the uh, Patel to the FBI. So that's gonna be very interesting. And also Masson Bolos to serve as an advisor to the Arab and Middle East affairs. So more peace talks possibly breaking out that most likely will be bullish for the market. But let's dive into the levels right now of what we have to know for the S&P, NASDAQ, IWM, and how we can profit in the game plan for this week. So this week is pretty much a slam dunk easy week. We got job numbers, we got PAL this week. So we can expect that some catalyzed reaction towards the end, the later half of the week, Wednesday and Friday particularly. But if we look at this simply, we are setting up a for the risk reward to be to the upside. We only got a, about a dollar before we break out to the upside, which subsequently we have to go all the way down three, four dollars to know bearish tendencies in the market, which could easily rebound heading to the upside. So how I would be playing this is the second we breach 603, new all time high blue sky breakout, sell them puts, buy them calls, and subsequently just run the market up higher as we head into a 
very, very interesting time. Remember, the VIX is consolidating around $13 to $12, so premiums are still decent. So if you're buying options, you have to be aware that, hey, you could get some appreciation if VIX goes up, if any turmoil happens, but you're not expecting large appreciation. So it's pretty much split between whichever train you want to take. If you want to take the selling the option train or buying the option train, it's equal to both sides. I personally favored the selling side because VIX is in an interesting level. It's not depressed too much. I don't expect massive downside on top of there's no indication of massive downside. That's why my portfolio is primarily structured into semis and a long, longer rotating dated options of selling. So that's how I just personally structure my portfolio. But enough about my portfolio. Let's talk about what the game plan is exactly for S&P. So we break above there, we sell. Um, and then subsequently, 599, if we come down to it and chop around, that's where I'd be looking to maybe load up on those preemptive bullish positions, probably 25% of what I want to load up for the week. And then the remaining 75% once we break 603. Now, what if we break below the nine day moving average? Why am I saying the nine? Because it can be your moving target. Right now it's sitting right at 559. And subsequently, if we break down below the nine consistently for two days, then the bearish trend is intact. We'll see also what's similar of the NASDAQ and the IWM. They have more correlated uh, levels that we can anchor to, to know if the S&P is gonna break down with them. So s and is probably gonna be your lagging indicator. Your NASDAQ and the Russell are gonna be your leading indicator. So let's just look and recap the S&P and then we'll jump over the NASDAQ. So a 603 breakout buy, 599 buying point, and 595, hey, some yellow flag, something's broken, we need to reanalyze and take a look. And again, uh, moving 90 moving average, sitting at 595.30 right now, is going to be that moving target you can also use for the downside potential. So jumping over to the NASDAQ real quick, we can clearly see that, again, a much tighter range with multiple above targets. So simply with the NASDAQ, because it was lagging behind, I would expect this to be the leading indicator and then the Russell be the secondary leading indicator. The NASDAQ, again, poised at a 506.96 buying point, that region, nine day moving average, extremely tight below it at 505.37. And subsequently, 5.11.45 is going to be the breakout territory. But we also got the previous all-time high of 5.15.37. That is where, hey, just step on the gas with buying option calls and selling puts. Break above 5.11.45 is where I would do that 25% that I did on the S&P. And then 5.15 would be that 75% mark on the S&P because I don't want to see that retracement, right? NASDAQ really has a tendency when it breaks out, it just keeps going. So I want to be sure of that breakout because like above 511.45 is a weekly breakout, but not a blue sky breakout, which subsequently allows us to retrace. If we break above 515, the probability of a retrace is still there. However, it is very, very, very low. Again, breaking below 501.94 is a complete break of trend breaking below the nine day, breaking below the weekly level, breaking below consolidated period. And then we're really looking at that 50 day to be our target. That's where again, yellow flag and even red for the NASDAQ because that is a break of trend is making lower highs and uh, possibly making lower lows at that point. And we would have to reassess. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. So when that weekly update video midweek comes out, you guys know exactly where we are with the market, where we are with the levels and all that good stuff. And we can give you tidbits of what to advise on what to do. Now, the Russell, the next big thing that I haven't really been covering for quite some time, but Russell is finally becoming one of those like big value trades. And subsequently, we're closing right at that 242 buying point. It's gonna be very interesting to see how futures open up and subsequently if we are going to be in a buying opportunity for the russell on open could see some rotation into tech as the russell may sell off a little bit so seeing 239.24 print on the russell wouldn't be super super concerning but i do not want to stay below there below one day so subsequently if the russell has a rotationary with s p and nasdaq pushing up russell selling off and we see the nash normal rotation okay i give it i if i see russell s p nasdaq running okay it's pretty much a done deal trade 242, 25%, 244, 75% of the things we want to initiate this week and subsequently riding this thing up higher. Again, the Russell, if we look
look at on a monthly view is not at all time highs. The all time high for the Russell was gonna, we breached it, right, this last week, but we didn't have a closing basis. So, subsequently, Russell hasn't had this massive rally to SP and NASDAQ. So, if you guys missed out on the SP and NASDAQ, Russell wouldn't be a bad option out there, especially with the bullishness that is going on in the week. A doji style candle for the week could be consolidation and retracing to the downside potential or it could be the halfway point of the rally so if we see this massive rally that we just had could be sending up a very interesting a to b pattern that we still have not completed we completed 251 so subsequently we already confirmed trading above it so we really want to see that 251 push this week which would leave approximately 3.69 percent upside on the russell and again Breaking above 244, you ride it to 251 roughly. That's a wonderful, wonderful trade. Easy 3% cash out. Good to go. Look for re-entry or if you just want to run it for the long term. Again, Tom Lee has said 40% rally on the Russell. I do see that happening in 2025. I don't necessarily see it happening this year because, well, it's just too short of a time for that massive rally. However, crazier things have happened. I have been completely wrong about Bitcoin. And I said 100K by Q2 of next year is heard me. And I made that prediction back here. And subsequently, we were like, nope, 100K today. So Bitcoin has had a relatively uh, small retracement, three days roughly right here. And it's just anyone's game at this point with the 100K within striking distance. Again, 125 is going to be that next psychological number. But this thing could very easily be pushing a A to B pattern right here with that retracement pushing to 124, 275. Again, 125K being that psychological number. So we could be on another route to 25K. So hypothetically, you're looking at 7% downside upwards of probably 30, 40% upside if we're seeing 125, right? Yeah, 30% upside. So with Bitcoin, I do see that you have an anchored point right around this 92 to be your stop loss point and then subsequently run it to 125. Pretty good odds, right? Uh, 37 to seven. So you're looking at five to one odds. I would definitely take that trade with a small position. However, I do not trade Bitcoin enough. So make sure you guys do your analysis on Bitcoin to understand how it trades. Remember what they say, um, jack of all trades, master of none. So if you're trading Bitcoin, make sure you understand and trade Bitcoin consistently. I trade the markets consistently through options. That's what my bread and butter is. Again, I'm not going to know everything. I'm just giving you an analysis of what I'm seeing on Bitcoin. It could definitely be a runner up here and even a smaller A to B pattern pushing up to 111, right? Again, the, with the small region of consolidation that we had, I feel 111 would be a smarter target than 125 because 125 is a little bit stretched, but you could do trailing stop losses. You could just keep moving your stops up. Various different things that could be going on. And subsequently, I talked about VIX. VIX finally coming back down to that $12 price point after I buy in around this $15 price point, but I really don't care. VIX options are meant to lose money. They're an insurance policy that pays out 31 if anything happens and allows me to be more bullish on the market than it is bearish. That was a quip from Safe Haven by Mark Spitznagel. If you guys haven't read that book, highly, highly recommend. It basically explains how um, collateralizing a VIX will allow you to trade more bullish, put more risk out on the market without actually putting your portfolio at risk. If you guys don't understand that, make sure you go check out his book. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. And subsequently, let's finish off with the international markets. HSI catching a little bit of bounce, still downtrending. Nikkei just going sideways again. The U.S. is the number one game in town. So subsequently, we want to be basically looking the U.S. number one as some would say, the dollar retracing a little bit after the, some of the news that came out with the indexes. However, if we look at this on a longer term time frame, it's just a basically gigantic sideways consolidation that's trying to break out now. We could see some volatility, especially heading into the election as we just were and subsequently the end of the year. So we're gonna keep an eye on the dollar just to see how it plays out, maybe have a little bit of a retracement leg and push higher again. Stronger dollar doesn't necessarily mean bad stock market, 
but it's historically correlated that way. However, if we look at some of the bigger cap stocks like Apple looking to make a blue sky breakout, thank you, good Apple. I got options on it. Microsoft looking like it finally wants to join the club. The NASDAQ we went over. Google, even though they're getting sued by the DOJ and try to get breaking up, people are still willing to buy it. Having a nice bounce and close above the 50. Keep an eye on this one. It's probably gonna be the top of the list for buying opportunities along with Microsoft. And Meta, almost getting above that 50-day moving average. It's been fighting it. Meta and Microsoft, the two M's, have been duking it out with these 50-day moving averages. Definitely could be an interesting buying opportunity there. Amazon, as it's heading into this holiday season, could be looking at a very interesting buying opportunity. Nice little bounce here to the upside. So even possibly sending up an A to B pattern on the way up would have to confirm trading above 215 and 225 target for that one. So make sure you guys keep an eye on that. And last but not least, Tesla looking like it's consolidating classical bull flag pattern. If we basically take this at face value of the rally, we're looking at roughly 428, right at that 420 number on Tesla. You can't make this stuff up. The jokes write themselves. And Netflix basically heading into next earnings to do a reverse stock split 10 to 1 as it's basically going to the threshold of $1,000 per share. So this thing has just been absolutely insane after Jake Paul fight and just insane. Netflix is just a juggernaut. As some have said, it honestly could be the next meta in the sense of people discounted meta when it was $100 and this thing just went ballistic. So again, these mega caps are pushing the market, but they're showing extreme, extreme amount of strength. And with that, guys, we're going to jump over the biggest winners and losers, and then we'll be back for the debate section of the video. We're going to discuss Powell, the job numbers, expectations, Fed, everything and more. So stay tuned for that and fatal will. Taking a look at this five day week for the market, seeing that we only had three days, well, technically three and a half days of trading, markets only gained around 0.21% on the five day. And we can see that the market ended the week at 6,032 points. Now we are going to do something a little bit different moving on. And that is taking a look at the dividend increases that companies have done for this past week. And of course we got the first one, Hormel Foods increasing their dividends by 3% for the 15th and consecutive year. Then we got the company GWRS hikes is the monthly dividend by 0.8% and HPQ raising their dividends by 5%. And now looking into the next upcoming earnings, we can see that we are at the beginning of December, final month of the year. That's absolutely crazy. We got nothing on Monday, just Zscaler and then Credo. Then on Tuesday, we got Salesforce, Scotiabank, and a few other ones. Then on Wednesday, we got Chewy, Foot Locker, okay, Dollar Tree. That was going to be a big one. I mean, these three right here are pretty going to be the biggest ones. Cracker Barrel and Campbell's. And on Thursday, we got Lululemon, Dollar Journal, TD Bank, Ulta, which until you guys see the overall heat map for that one, that one's absolutely massive. And a bunch of other ones as well, including Kroger, the likes of Kroger, which I didn't even realize. And lastly, on Friday, we got BRP and Genesco. And now taking a look at this heat map, we can see that there's a lot of green here. Honestly, the red was mainly concentrated in the energy as well as the deep red was in the technology sector. Taking a look at this, we got over here the worst performer being the company none other than Adele losing 8.16% and the best performer. It is none other than the company Enphase gaining 12.24% on the week. Then we got the consumer cyclicals and Guys, almost all of these are very much in the green. We can see here that the worst performer was the company Smurfit Westrock, okay, losing 2.4%. And the best performer overall in this whole entire sector, oh my goodness, this is going to be a little bit difficult to find. Actually, no, it's not because I just mentioned it a few minutes ago. And that is, of course, the company Ulta gaining 14.13% on the week. Then when it comes to the consumer defensives, a lot of green here as well. Only two lost. That's actually kind of crazy. Those two were Clorox losing 1.17 and the worst performer, Church and Dwight, which is a company I do like a lot, losing 1.89%. Still, though, very near that all-time highs. Overall, though, the best performer, it is none other than the company um, Target, by the looks of it. Yeah, gaining 8.82% after a big, big drop a few days ago. 
Looking now into the financials, we can see also a lot of green here as well. Worst performer, it is the company. Actually, only a few of them, only four of them lost overall. But the worst performer was Morgan Stanley, losing 2.5%. And the best performer, it is none other than the company. Capital One Financial, gaining 5.13%. Then when it comes to the healthcare, actually, sorry, no, when it comes to the communications, I forgot that this thing got messed up on me. When it comes to the communications sector, worst performer here, it is the company EA losing 2.56%. And the best performer, it is the company IPG gaining 5.7% into now the healthcare there we go we have the worst performer being the company amgen losing 2.42 percent which is a company i really do like and uh under 300 dollars that seems like a pretty good bargain reason for this drop is because i think they had an issue with one of the drugs or something like that not really anything to be worried about really and the best performer it is none other than the company moderna getting 12.57 percent but you got companies like avvi gaining 6.52 after a big big drop as well and eli Lilly also getting 6.06 percent on the week too then we got the industrials we can see here that this is a lot of green overall guys this is a lot of green everywhere worst performer there's a company chrw robinson worldwide losing 2.73 but also lockheed martin following close behind at 2.33 percent now 529 dollars and 41 cents overall though the best performer it is the company um copart gaining 11.41% on the week. Looking now into the real estate, a lot of green here overall, two guys, a lot of green here overall. We got the worst performer, actually the only one that lost was uh, Ventas, losing 0.36%, 0.36%. And the best performer seems to be none other than the company. Uh, it's a, almost a tie between Equinix and CBR Group, but it's CBR Group gaining 6.33 and Equinix gaining 6.27% into now the energy sector whoo this is where the red is right here boys this is where the red here is overall though the worst performer actually only a few of them gain but the worst performer seems to be the company uh yeah seems to be guys the company exxon mobile losing 3.26 percent and the best performer it is philip 66 gaining 1.96 percent into now the utilities the worst performer here it is vistras losing 4.06 percent and the best performer it is nrg gaining 4.87 percent all in all though all of these other companies gained a decent amount as well so you didn't really mess up this week when it came to the utilities either and lastly the basic materials worst performer it is newmont losing three point oh you guys can't even see that it is newmont losing 3.19 percent let me just fix that for you 3.19 percent and the best performer it is the company sherwin williams getting 3.67 percent on the week all in all though you guys can see that Man, we're still in a massive, massive euphoria in general. Now, we have no idea how things are going to turn out, especially coming of the new year, uh, you know, with, with the new Congress, with Trump and all that stuff. So we will see what happens. But by the looks of it, guys, I have a feeling that we're going to get a melt up in the markets. So... It is what it is. Not really what I was hoping for, but there's still opportunities to be had here in companies that honestly, you know, were massively up. And now you have a chance to buy them. For example, NVIDIA, $138, just saying. But that does it for this segment of the video, guys. With that said, take it away, Mike. So I figure off we start talking about PCE and <clears throat> kind of the week that was. And then we kind of dive into the man, the myth, the legend speaking on Wednesday, Jerome Powell. So, you know, your portfolio is going to go poof on Wednesday uh, with everything going on. Um, PCE, what do you think? I I'm like, meh. I mean, we covered it live uh, yeah. on on Wednesday, and that was uh, man, that was a hoot. Cause like I'm over here starting at eight thirty, and then <laughs> and they shipped the goalpost. They they shipped it over to ten o'clock. I'm just like, what is this? What when the world is this? The fact that everything came in line, I don't know. I I don't know because it's like it's like on one hand, that's not good, but on the other hand, it's not bad either so i don't know um i don't know what the cme tool even looks like now in regards uh, to what's look. going to happen so actually you know w what have we always said we have always said that they're going <clears> to <throat> find a reason to get rate cuts they're going to find a reason <clears throat> to run it up and <clears throat> case in point 66 to 34 where we're wow. essentially higher odds than we were previously of a fed rate cut 
Because so we here's like also the fifteen nine ish last time. Right, and here's also the reason as to why we're getting rate cuts is because the government cannot afford to keep paying those yeah. higher interests. Well, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that, right? We covered it also on the live stream that the reverse repo they're going to pay the lower end of the federal funds rate on it. No yep. longer are they going to pay the higher end. And it's still staying around stability about 200, right? Like if we just look at it long term, yes, it's downtrending like long term. And then like if we go in a little bit closer, still it's still in a moderate downtrend, but it, it kind of tapers off. And the thing is, they're no longer going to incentive. They, they don't want the money here. They want it to go out into the market. It is their way of pushing liquidity because if you're federal funds rate, right? Because it's like you said, it's a range. The current is 4.7 to 4.5. Five to five. Yep. You're paying a quarter basis point now less on the reverse repo that traditionally will go and buy basically bonds. And if we look at the bond market, right, the, the second that news was announced, hey, everyone's jumping over to the standard bond market because yep. I can either go to the reverse repo and get the overnight, right? But if we look at something similar to like the one month, which is pretty much the equivalent of the reverse repo, uh, you can see that I can get 4.7%, which is more than I can get on the reverse repo. And the disc, the problem with the short-term interest rates is because they have a very short maturity. So people are going to want to lock in that longer dated um, maturities. So right. if you go through it, right? At the higher yield, at the higher yield as yeah. well. So if we go to like the 10-year, right? Yes, it is cheaper than the, um, sorry, the yield is lower than the reverse repo. But I'm guaranteeing a 4.1 on basically a long dated 10 years of interest payment versus yep. overnight, right? Because overnight the Federal Reserve can come out and be like, hey, 100 basis point cut and there goes my four point something percent versus here I'm still getting a long dated 4% yield. And the markets are basically saying they believe inflation is going to stick around for a little bit, right? That's based right. on the pricing. But they're also right. not expecting it to rise significantly because they're piling into bonds as we saw with like TLT, right? Where TLT, if we look at long-term uptrend, right? Just simple. High, higher lows, confirmed right. triple higher lows, having um, debt, cr uh, debt cross that's basically being saved right now by the the uh, <clears throat> latest news from the Federal Reserve and the expectation of rate cuts, right? So TLT right now has formed basically a bottom, right, that we can appear, but how is it gonna play out with the job numbers that are coming out this week along with Powell, right? Because we True. got a boat True. on deck yeah. this week. Um, like I said, on Wednesday, we're going to get the your portfolio completely obliterated by the main or not. legend himself. Or not. Yeah, or, or it's going to go straight up, right? <laughs> it's going to go straight to the moon. But, right. But uh, Monday, we got ISM Manufacturing. Pretty much the only news that we're getting on Monday that's actually relevant. We're going to get that speculative positions because they didn't publish them on Friday with the shorter trading day, but we got Williams speaking again. Again, Williams, the last time he spoke, basically confirmed rate cuts in December, which did bolster the market. But I believe the market's gonna be looking at what is the future path of rate cuts? What is the right. um, projection, right? And in approximately, was it 18 days? Yes, Federal Reserve meaning 18 days. 18 days. We're gonna find out what their 2020-25 outlook is. And that's gonna be an extremely volatile event because Everyone wants to know what what that outlook is because they're not expecting as many rate cuts as we thought, right? So if we look at the outlook, and I think let's look at June to kind of gauge what their outlook is going to be because really once you get into December, it's just like a wash, right? Like if we go mm -hmm. out to December, it's like pick your poison of where you're going to be, like two, three rate cuts, four. It's somewhere around three to four, right? The consensus right now is in December all next year, you're going to get three rate cuts of 25 basis points. And then there's some people in the camp of four, some people in the camp of two. So the odds are pretty much set up in a nice little range for the Fed to come in and basically give you a soft landing per se, right? Like they're not able to rip your expectations apart, right? Because if they come in with the two, 21% eh, believe that, right? Okay. Um, the ones are four is still a stretch, but three is the consensus. So they're most likely going to come out and kind of give you this like three rate cut. That would be expected. 
I do think with a lot of the doves that are on the Federal Reserve Board now going into this year, you're going to see the four rate cut projection in the SEP because they're doves. They just love giving you that, right? Like we saw once, um, what was it? What was this super uh, super hawk um, that retired? Uh, I I know exactly what you're talking. I was actually about to mention him. Um, I, I I forget the name, but there was one guy that yeah. was like a super hawk that every time he's just like, nope, yeah, we're not. No I'm, I'm voting not member. to. So basically, we're heading into Dove voting member territory, which is gonna side with like you saw how the SEPs all of a sudden started changing to be more dovish mm-hmm. and more dovish and mm-hmm. more dovish as you're heading into a very dovish, soft landing, egotistical right. scenario for the Fed. Right. Right. But the main thing we got job expectations, and we actually do have we have that yet? Do we have the uh, great. the Friday ones? Do we have the? Well, we'll get to there. We'll get to there. So, okay, Joel's okay. is expecting an increase slightly of job openings, kind of staying around the same, seven point four four three versus seven point four nine expected now. Um, okay. Basically, fifty million, uh, no, fifty thousand plus or minus. Not a huge swing, right? We didn't. We're kind of in this territory where. I see more upside to the number than downside to the number. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. ADP coming in at 166 versus 233 previously. Wow, that's I, a lot. That's a big difference right there. This number is so garbage. It's it so is. garbage. Every time I agree. this thing has come out since two years ago, they really, st- like, there was a period of six months that they were neck and neck. And then yeah, and then it just horrible. diverted from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll get some mortgage data, right? Because with housing and everything, we may get cheaper mortgage rates now based on the buying that's going on. And obviously, Powell speaking right at towards the Goldilocks end of the market on Wednesday. Gotta love it. You know, you just gotta pump that market for a pounder hour time. Uh Uh-huh. And then uh, we got Barkin speaking initial. Thursday's probably gonna be the lowest job, um, lowest uh, news day out of the whole week. Then we get into the creme de la creme, unemployment ticking up, 0.1 expected for unemployment, non-farm payrolls expected to come in 202,000. Okay, okay, so we have, okay, so I'm gonna have to stop you right here, because this is where we're going to get a whole lot of information. Like the minor, minor details, this is where things are going to start showing up. And what I mean is, sure, sure, we might get higher than that 12,000 that we got previous. But will that twelve thousand get revised lower? <laughs> Is it going to? That's be, the hey, question. Revise the twelve to negative two hundred, and then Ooh. add in two hundred to the, the payroll number. I'm very curious to see as to if that twelve k is that going to get revised up or down? Because if that number, if if the new number comes in, right, comes in anywhere near that two hundred and two, but then that twelve one gets revised downward, God forbid, into the negatives. Guess what's going to happen? People are going to take a look into that negative or that revision downwards. People are going to take or the opposite, right? Or the opposite. But I fear that people are just going to focus on the on the brand new shiny number when in reality it means (laughs) nothing. Because there's no way there's no possible way that you can tell me. Granted, this is for November. And in November, you did have, you know, Black Friday. It's usually companies hire a lot more for Black Friday. I know for a fact that FedEx specifically does like a month where they hire temps yeah. for Black Friday only, right? So Which, you actually may get a decent bump because of that. But if it's anything, if it's like too high from the 12K, I'm like, man, I refuse to believe that anything, I, I guess refuse is the wrong word, but it's hard to believe that from one month to the other, you had such a big difference or, right such a massive difference or is it this is the real number and then the 12k gets revised higher could be also yeah could be also could be also you know, the but... government screws up everything we've seen that with like doge and everything about how they can't even like i don't know if you saw um clear value tax actually i did apply to doge and i like, guess talking... what guess what by the way by the way about that uh i on on x I posted saying at Doge, please consider, uh, you know. <laughs> nice. Uh, yes, I, I did that. I, I, I love I, his um, explanation I did that. about how he has clients that have very like conservative assessments and they get audited every year. But the ones yep. that like ream, like borderline uh, tax fraud. No, they're yep. perfectly fine. They're, they're, they're absolutely fine. Yep. <laughs> I'm yep. Like, so, is it, is it, it should be an example of this. Where it's like, oh, the 12K is a mistake. We forgot a zero. 
and I really do hope that if um, if we do get any any massive revision, I hope that um, Doge, right, Elon and Vivek, and even Trump to some extent, they they absolutely use that to, and, and be like, this cannot continue, yeah. right? This cannot continue we because can't. it's straight up like, why can't we? Like, okay, fine, there are revisions. I get that. Stuff like that. Not by stuff a like million, right? Like right, we saw stuff the million like million job revision. Right, like the million job revisions that we had, it's just like, yo, that is not a mistake. That is not, like, okay, fine, a thousand, two thousand. Okay, understandable. I'll give you ten k. I'll give you, I'll give you a hundred k revision over six months and ten k per error per. Because right, like you, you know, you they're trying to compile all this data within one month and try to get it. At, I, I get it, right? And we're not, we're not trying to say that like you can't have revisions. But a million job revision with the numbers being revised close to 100K every single time, plus minus, and like sometimes they revise a negative, then they put back the positive, then they revise the positive back to the yeah. negative. I'm like, I'm getting whiplash yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. And that's just with job numbers. I mean, GDP is even worse, well, right? GDP is no, no, absolutely no, no. even worse. I got worse. one better, CPI. Or CPI, yeah, take, CPI is- Take stuff out that we don't like. Right. I, you know something that that should be something that uh, that they do that hey when it comes to CPI when it comes to inflation the Department of Labor which that's the that's not the Fed that's the the Department of Labor should everything should be included yeah. everything should be included equal, what is this with a consumption rating right so like what what percentage do consumers need this for example energy should have a huge weighting because you can't energy and just food. Like magically go without energy I can go without coffee I can go without chocolate I can go without electronics i can go without like a lot of things like car insurance the um car insurance medical expenses energy uh food right like I, certain categories well not of food, food to not some extent optional. food to some extent not yeah no. certain i said certain categories right so like poultry eggs milk like your basic core like candy and stuff Staples. sure make it optional yeah. i don't i don't care Right. right, but like right. your core necessity for existence should be like eighty percent of the CPI score. Then we right. sprinkle in all the other stuff. And honestly, um, maybe shelter. this is a video. You want something? Maybe this is the video that that we should do. Is um, is be like, hey, the Department of Labor should get rid of uh, core, the core nonsense. Oh. That should be you a video be that funny. we should do. You bring, you, okay, you can't fire Pal, but you can make his life living hell by oh, getting yeah, rid of core. Because, yeah, the, the Department of Labor, okay, fine, fine, fine. Trump can't do anything to Powell. Okay, no problem. Trump has control over the Department of Labor. So they, uh, control let's- Control uh, statistic. Yeah, so let's just get rid of core, make only CPI, that's oh. it. You wanna keep PCE, <laughs> no problem, keep PCE, but, but get rid of everything core, everything core related. What oh. is this? Absolutely not. Make make it so that the Fed has to has to jump through a billion hoops in order to get the the number that they want. Oh, that's God. it. That's that would be that would troll. be a you great video, by the way. X because that is the greatest troll move. It's like you can't fire Powell. You should at Elon and Trump on that. Be like absolutely. If you can't fire if you can't fire, uh, fire Powell, step one. Get rid of core, make his life a living hell. Step yeah. two. Make make just one CPI, one inflation, Ooh. make everything in accordance to what people care about the most. And stop putting things like like I don't know, non alcoholic beverages is like twenty percent. Like, yeah, stop waiting like things like uh chocolate at ten percent of food. I'm like, no, nah, right. <laughs> just like the stupidity. Not that is it is, crazy. but you guys know what we mean. It's like the idea yep. that we're we're focusing on things that we don't care about, right? It's like airfare. It's just like how many people care about that? Who nobody uh, we don't care. I can I airfare I can make an argument kind of because of like how people travel. Not when it comes to people's living though. Not when True. it comes it to people's life. It's much of the other stuff, but it's one of those categories that's like eh. But regardless, that is a, actually a pretty good idea. Yeah. I, I I just hope that we'll I mean we'll see what happens. We shall see what happens when it comes to this upcoming uh, when it comes to this upcoming um, uh, number uh, job numbers. It's gonna be an interesting one because we're gonna take a look into now. This is the November one, so Black Friday, Cyber Monday is gonna be a part of it. Oh yeah, so it's gonna. I be guess very not Cyber Monday with this expectation, right? Like how it's uh, structured. 
But I do want to dive into a couple uh, more things before we conclude. And that sure. is our favorite fear and greed index. Basically, making We're agreed. all the bears uh, scream bloody murder uh, this I week. would like to know. I would like to know. Sorry to interrupt you. But I would like to know what percent of this year has this needle been broken at the greed and extreme greed? I um, really am curious for that. If 50 is your line in the sand, it's actually been yep. even. It's actually really? been equal this year. Really? Yep. If you look, right? So look, we spent all of January to April in greed to extreme greed. Then we spent most of April through July into neutral territory. We spent July to October mostly in neutral to fear. And now we're spending neutral to greed in um, October to now. All right. It's actually quite no. balanced, right? It's like, and the moments you don't think it, it doesn't is. feel that way. Does not feel well, that way. Well, it, it's like this: when your team's winning, it's like great. When your team's losing, it's like you scream bloody murder and you remember it all the time. So fair enough. But we haven't seen extreme greed, even though the stock market uh, this week went. I think high it did all time highs, right? Uh, yeah, we actually closed at all time highs, I believe. Yep, we closed wow. at all time highs on the S and P, and we also. Uh, closed, I believe, on the NASDAQ shy. We closed shy of all time highs on the NASDAQ, but tech was a pretty big lagger, especially with like NVIDIA, right? Just having one of those like really crappy weeks. But mm -hmm. it, in my opinion, based on the price action on Friday with everyone buying it back up, there's a huge probability we start a rally week. Again, we're going into Santa Claus rally phase. So That's the question true. is. Is it time to basically keep buying or is it time to keep uh, hold, batting down the hatches? I would argue the Russell being coming back to life is the thing that's kind of fueling the market higher. And we definitely see what like RSP. RSP close at all-time highs. S&P and NASDAQ closing near or at all-time highs. So again, the, the bullishness continues. Not to mention that there are companies that have fallen this past week. I'll give you an example. NVIDIA did fall. Yeah, NVIDIA. NVIDIA ate my lunch for a couple of days. Yeah, but, yes, it um, did. I also, that. like, just Bitcoin, right? Yep. Retraced, went right back near all-time highs. It's like, I'm like, I'm not even going to give a prediction about Bitcoin because the second I give a prediction, it's like, okay, okay, you see all this time you put in between here? Like, no, we're just going to, like, do this. Yeah. It's yeah. like, uh, I'm going to say Bitcoin 150K in next week. And it's like, no, t tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, it's like... Or within this three thing days. Was like, yep. uh, let's see, how many down days? One, two. Okay, nope, uh, nope, nope. Three, not allowed. Three, not allowed to the moon. So. so it's going to be an interesting week, to say the least. And we are heading now to the last month of the year and the last month of the quarter for Q4. So yeah, And remember, this week's going to be mostly bullish for two reasons. Santa Claus rally... 401k money coming in. Hedge oh, that's funds. true. Remember, hedge fund grading, annual grading is this month, meaning they're going to have to buy all the stuff that's been performing this year to show that they made, uh, that they owned, right? They owned it through the whole year to then show to their clients, look how wonderful your portfolio is doing, right? It's, right? it's all this pig in a pokery. But again, fighting bearish this week this yeah. month is probably this month. Yeah. historically the worst time to be bearish. Yeah. I agree it's with that. It's the best time to be bullish, the worst time to be bearish. Right. I agree with that sentiment. So it'll be an interesting month to say the least. Yep. And one last gloating thing for me. Good sir. It did not invert. It went to zero. It went to okay. zero. <laughs> zero does not okay. count. Okay. Okay. Okay, but we'll see. yeah, it's gonna eat my lunch right here. It's just gonna go like, bloop. so it's gonna go right back up. All right. So, anything else you want to cover? No, nope, that's about it. All right. So, guys, thank you all so much for watching. We'll have the latest video uh, stream posted over here for you guys to watch if you want to check that one out, where we cover PC more in depth. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, and see you tomorrow.